The next step we can take to improve these methods, and, and currently this is um, sort of the, the minimum um, possible thing you could do in, say, computational chemistry. This is uh, now considered pretty crude and doesn't give you very good results. But at the time this was invented, this uh, Hartree-Fock method, and this is still the basis for a lot of the more complicated methods that are used. Um, we want a better way of finding trial functions. Instead of some, coming up with something ourselves, we want to define it based on the problem. Uh, and so we'll say that our wave function, our trial function, is going to, again, depend on R1 and R2. Um, but now we don't specifically define these functions phi. They're going to be based on hydrogen wave functions, but um, we have sort of generic functions that we determine based on the problem. Um, so uh, essentially, they have a lot of variational parameters. And it's going to they're going to change from problem to problem exactly what these look like. So the idea here is that if we look at our system, right, so in this case we're looking at particularly the helium atom, we have our two electrons, and the whole problem is that these two electrons interact with each other. And it's, it's difficult to model that precisely, right? We can't do that uh, unless, except for using approximation methods. Uh, so if we know one of these wave functions, though, say we know the solution for phi of R1, right? We know the electron one wave function. We know its probability then. We know that'll be equal to phi one star phi R1. Uh, and this is going to give the probability distribution. Now our electron two is interacting with electron one but we can kind of average out that interaction. Uh, and what, what the Hartree-Fock method does is we sort of take the average um, charge distribution of electron one based on this probability distribution. And so that gives us a way to find what's the potential energy, right? And that's the big term that, that gives us trouble is that the potential energy um, is not something we can um, put into an exactly solvable state. So what we can say is that electron two uh, interacts with 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 an average charge. Put that in quotes. It's really like an average charge distribution. You know, we know the distribution of where electron one will be, and electron two is interacting with that. And so we can say that the effective potential energy for electron two, which is a function of R two is going to be basically the expectation value of this um, interaction with electron one. So we have our phi r1. So our, our wave function for electron one, uh, and then we have our, this is, this is our electron electron repulsion term here. Uh, and essentially what we're doing is taking an expectation value here, like what's the average, right? So then we can define a Hamiltonian for electron two, an effective Hamiltonian based on this effective uh, potential energy. And that'll be our kinetic energy term for electron two uh, minus our attraction with the nucleus plus this effective uh, potential energy term uh, that's based on this average um, interaction with electron one. Then we can solve our Schrodinger equation for electron two, this effective Hamiltonian, phi r2 will give us some energy based on r2. Okay, now the problem here is, and, and we solve this and that gives us the wave function and energy for electron two. Now the problem is, to get this wave function, we needed to know what the initial wave function is, right, for electron one. And the wave function should be the same for electron one and electron two. There's nothing different about them in this particular system, right? They're both gonna be in one, one S orbitals. So there's a circular dependence here. To find the wave function, we need the effective potential, but to find the effective potential, we need the wave function. And so in practice, what we actually do, this is an iterative process. We need at least a, a decent guess for electron one. Right, so 
Um, so we need a guess for the initial wave function. And often, we, and usually we've solved problems like this. And so we have an, a good idea of what this should be. Uh, and then use this to find the effective potential energy. And we find a wave function for electron two, but we let that equal electron one. And this is a big loop that we go do over and over again. All right, and so what this looks like, this is, a, this is great for computers because computers are good at doing the same thing over and over again. So we have an input, let me spell that correctly, an input that is our guess for phi r1. We use that to find an effective potential energy, which gives us an effective Hamiltonian, which we can use to solve an effective Schrodinger equation to give us a new wave function as an output. And we do this until we get the same wave function. All right, so we repeat until we get the same thing, until nothing changes. All right, and so this, uh, this process is called the self-consistent field method. Um, and so the problem is considered self-consistent Right, so it, it doesn't change uh, this field, this average electric field. Um, let me just get all my acronyms here. This is SCF, self-consistent field method. Um, so we, we keep doing this in, until nothing changes and the problem is self-consistent with itself. All right, now what do these phi look like? So phi is generally defined as linear combinations of Slater orbitals. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about um, computational chemistry where this is actually implemented. Linear combinations of Slater orbitals with variational parameters, right? So we have a bunch of things that we can change and that's what we use to actually, you know, change things between iterations. Now, if we do this with the uh, helium atom, we do this uh, self-consistent field approximation, the Hartree-Fock energy is a little bit better still, but not still not great. 2.8617 Hartree's. So still not as good as like the multiple orders of perturbation theory. And the main reason that this still uh, overestimates the energy is that uh, we're missing what's known as electron-electron correlation. So the fact that the two electrons are not actually independent of each other, right? One is going to be spin up and spin down. We'll talk about spin in just a minute or in the next video. Um, but it's our assumption that we can treat the electrons independently that causes the error that we see. So assumption that electrons are independent leads to errors. And so further, what are known as post hartree fock methods um, uh, take that into account. They, they try and um, account for this correlation that electrons do affect each other and not through this average um, thing that Hartree-Fock does.